Okay. All right. Well, um, I just first want to say a big thank you to MAPS and especially to Liana for making it possible for me to be here today. Um, I also want to say a special word of thanks to my colleague, David Armistead, who's sitting out there someplace. Um, a lot of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today come directly from work that I'm doing with him. So what I want to talk about today um, is a, an approach for delivering psychedelic therapy. Um, the approach is called the pollinator approach. And before we can get into uh, talking about the approach itself, I want to set the stage by talking for a few minutes first about the current system for delivering mental health care. So the current model that we have um, is what I refer to as the pharmaceutical model. And what this model basically, this model started in the 1950s with the advent of antipsychotic drugs. And it views mental illness as a set of biologically based symptoms. And as a result, mental illness can presumably be treated by uh, using psychiatric drugs. So in terms of outcomes, this model has been extremely lucrative for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, psychiatric drugs generate almost $90 billion in annual revenues. That's up from $2.8 billion in 1987, which is the year that Prozac came onto the market. In terms of mental health outcomes, the evidence is uh, more mixed. So the US suicide rate, for example, is the highest that it's been in 50 years, and it's currently increasing. The US has the highest rate of death among peer countries from substance abuse, and, uh, substance abuse disorders and uh, mental health. So what I want to uh, discuss now is the economic approach, um, some of the economic principles embodied in this model. And the specific point I want to make is that the economic approach of the pharmaceutical model has contributed to both of these outcomes, to the extreme uh, financial success of the pharmaceutical industry and also to um, kind of the state of mental health in the US and many other developed countries. So there are two specific elements of the model that I want to focus on. The first is economic individualism. So in order to explain this, it's easiest just to use an example. So the first, uh, the first photo here with the year is 1958, it got a little messed up, um, is for an antipsychotic drug. So again, the year is 1958. And if you look at the ad, you see that the patient has a social context. He's in a house. There are other people there, um, a woman, a relative, or maybe his wife. The guy looks like he might be his doctor. And the patient himself, um, he has an occupation or a hobby of some sort. He's smiling. Um, when we fast forward to 1975 to an ad for, for a schizophrenic drug, the patient has changed completely. The patient is now a mime, devoid of social context, presumably devoid of an internal life. So one of the elements is this shift from socially embedded individual to individualistic economic consumer. Okay, so that, that's element number one. The second element is a hands-off public policy approach. So back in the early 70s, uh, a, a very well-known economist from the University of Chicago, which is known for its free market economics, convened uh, in uh, a conference for the ph pharmaceutical industry. And the agenda for this conference was basically to come up with a PR approach, a PR approach to convince regulators, policymakers, and the public at large that a hands-off approach to regulating the industry, a hands-off approach to economic regulation would, would lead to the best outcomes. Now, of course, what this actually did was it allowed for the industry to become much more concentrated. So what this chart shows you is the combined market share of the top firms in the industry and how much that increased from 1982 to 1999. And as a result, prices also rose dramatically. And we can see the, uh, we can see the large uptick in prices since 1980 with the US leading the pack. Okay, so these two elements, this economic individualism, individualism and this hands-off um, policy approach that are behind the success, the financial success of the pharmaceutical model have also dominated business and public policy more generally for four decades. Now, we don't have time to go into all the different areas of, of economic and political life where this approach is used, but there is one outcome of it that I wanna to point to, and that outcome is economic inequality. So this individualistic, individualistic hands-off approach allows those who already have um, great resources to leverage those resources to gain even more at the expense of everybody else. And we can see the, uh, what you, you can see on the chart over there, the uh, vast widening of income inequality in the US. The blue line shows the share of income taken home by the bottom 50%. The red line shows the share of income taken home by the top 1%. And we can see how those have flipped 
since 1980, when the chart begins. Since 1989, the net worth of, um, of the top 1% has gone up $21 trillion, while the net worth of the bottom 50% has actually declined by, five, uh, by $900 billion. So greater economic equality and this individualistic, hands-off economic approach that's behind it is also associated with greater mental distress. And the best evidence of this comes from looking across countries. So what this first chart shows you is the correlation between inequality and mental illness, and we can see a very distinct correlation with the U.S. leading the pack. We can also uh, see a similar pattern in the relationship between inequality and, drug and uh, illegal drug use, which is a proxy um, for addiction. So it would be counterproductive to deliver a revolutionary mental health care treatment using the same type of economic approach that's contributing to mental distress in the first place. So if, in order to think about what we can do instead, what an alternative is, we need to take a little bit of a deeper dive. And, uh, want, and so I want to focus for a moment on the disruption of community systems. Okay? So we could think of a community as a system of people and resources that are linked in multiple interdependent systems, cultural systems, economic systems, social systems, um, the, the list goes on. As in nature, healthy systems support individual and collective wellness. So I want to, as I said, there are, there are many systems that make up a community. I want to focus on two right now. The first is community social systems. So this individualistic, hands-off economic approach that's dominated business and public policy for at least four decades has led to what many others have referred to as a crisis of connection. 40% of Americans today feel isolated and without meaningful relationships. Between 1974 and 2012, the fraction who never spent time with neighbors rose by 50%. So community social systems have been disrupted. They're not functioning as a result of this economic approach. The same is true of community economic systems, where we have a parallel crisis, which I refer to as a crisis of extraction. All around the country, and in many other places in the world too, giant corporations have displaced local businesses. When that happens, the bulk of the economic value being produced in the community is extracted to remote actors and, and, and taken out of the community itself. Uh, for example, the CEO to worker pay ratio rose from 24 in 1980 to 312 in 2017. 84% of stock is now held by the wealthiest 10%. So we have these, these, these community systems being disrupted by this hands-off, individualistic economic approach. And the disruption of community systems leads, also has implications for the individual, where it leads to disconnection from self. There's a profound interdependence between the individual and society. So when people feel disconnected from their community social systems, their community economic systems, they question their own identity. So the, alienate, the alienating influence of social disconnection and economic extraction has fueled the rising, rate of rising rates of depression, anxiety, and addiction. So if we want to think about how to design a new approach, we have to account we have to recognize that the healing of individuals is interdependent with the healing of community systems. These must be approached together. The pollinator approach to mental health care, which is the one I'm going to outline for you now, seeks to heal individuals and community systems. It recognizes this interdependency. So a pollinator is a term from community economics. A pollinator organization is one that renews and recirculates resources within a community, much as uh, pollinator insects and animals do in nature. In this model, the treatment sites themselves are in communities and they function as pollinators within these communities. So the way that works is people receive psychedelic therapy and when they receive this therapy, it creates an opening for reconnection. There's a, there's a, a, there's a growing body of evidence that one of the uh, defining attributes of the psychedelic experience for many people is an openness to connection. So the key to this approach is when people are in that window of openness, openness to connection, to reconnect them to community systems. And that's done through close local partnerships with, uh, close partnerships with local organizations. What those organizations are will vary by community. In some communities, there'll be business organizations. In others, there'll be cultural organizations. In some communities, they'll, doubtless, they'll no doubt be religious organizations. But the key is to have these close partnerships, which create access, 
but also, again, provide a channel for people to be reintegrated into the community systems, which in turn revitalizes the systems themselves. Local ownership of treatment sites also uh, creates a recirculation within the community. In this case, recirculation of financial capital to support the community economic system. So it's, again, this is a way of starting to revitalize community systems. In this model, the pharmaceutical supplier itself, so in the case of MDMA, that will, uh, be, that will most likely, as we've, as we've heard, be MAPS, um, the pharmaceutical supplier itself also functions as a pollinator. Not only does it supply medicine to, the, to these community clinics, but it also shares learning among them. This model is incompatible with the pharmaceutical supplier being a for-profit corporation. For-profit for corporations are designed to reward financial shareholders and extract from others. They're not designed to promote recirculation of, of, of resources within communities. So, uh, so uh, MAPS is... Uh, MAPS is using a, a public benefit corporation as their model. There are other options too. Cooperatives uh, um, is another option. Importantly, the intent of the organization um, is just as important as the, as the legal form. Um, there's lots of examples of nonprofits um, and other forms of organizations uh, being co-opted. Okay, so the pollinator approach restores and supports community systems, which both complements and contributes to individual healing. So, can this really happen? So first of all, in terms of treatment sites, we already have some great evidence from the town of Frome, England. So in Frome, um, around 2011 or 12, they realized that a lot of people who were complaining, coming in for medical conditions, were also complaining of loneliness. So they started a program called Health Connectors, and they trained, uh, initially these were volunteers, as health connectors. When somebody came in complaining of, a med of loneliness for a medical condition, somebody came in for, for a medical condition and complained of loneliness, they would be um, assigned to a health connector. This person's job was not only to connect that person to health resources in the community, but to try to get them reintegrated into the community, into the social fabric of the community, into the economic fabric of the community, and the results have been amazing. The, a peer-reviewed study just came out. Relative to other towns in the same county, Frome has had a 46% relative decline in hospital visits, a 42% relative decline in healthcare costs, and the UK National Health Service saved six pounds for every pound that it spent. So elements of this model are already being, already being tried out with, with amazing success. In terms of funding, it's sometimes, argue, it's, it's sometimes been argued that you have to have for-profit corporations in order to raise the amount of funding necessary to bring a, a, bring a drug to market, but that's clearly not correct because we see how far MAPS has gotten. USONA is now in phase two clinical trials with psilocybin. Johns Hopkins received $17 million, as Rick mentioned earlier, and I think that, that just points to a trend um, that we're in a takeoff period for, these, for larger and larger gifts to come in. You know, in the U.S., there's $410 billion in annual giving each year, and $49 billion of that goes to the top 100 nonprofits. So that means that there are really big gifts out there. So there's plenty of money out there. So I, that, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, in terms of um, the actual process of change, systemic change is a bottom-up process. If you look at the way change happens in nature, it doesn't happen because some centralized authority says, let's have change, and pushes it down. Instead, what happens is change happens in isolated local pockets that are connected through networks, and when, when these changes become connected, systemic change emerges. Think about the fall of the Soviet Union. Independent, all these independent, uh, well, all these former Soviet republics started to uh, have these kind of local activities happening at around the same time, and when these activities connected, we had systemic change. So systemic change is an, is an emergent process. Um, okay, so uh, there's one bullet point I left out here, which I just wanna, whoops. That's not where I meant to go, but okay. Um, so my concluding comments, I, I, all right, ignore the slides. Um, yeah, so if we look at, in term, so we're still talking about change. If we look at the U.S. today, there was a recent study done where some academics traced income inequality back um, 10 millennia. Uh, they uh, looked at archaeological digs and looked at house sizes as measures of income inequality. Income inequality, which is the greatest predictor of conflict, um, is at its highest level in 10 millennia. So does that mean that we have to have a revolution? It doesn't. An another recent study um, compared violent 
protest to nonviolent protest, it found that on average, nonviolent protests were more successful and on average, it only, you only had to reach 3.5% of the population for a nonviolent protest to, to, to achieve its goals. So all the ingredients for change are there. And, and you already saw my last slide, which I don't know what happened to it. Um, oh, right, here, we're back at it again. So in response to the question, can this happen? Let's say it, it already is happening. All right, thank you.